Welcome to the Film Illiterates Podcast, your home for uninformed, unfiltered, ill-advised movie talk. As always, I am Joe Campbell, and joining me today, again, as always, are Alex Patton. Hello. And Nathan Stone. Hey, Joe. How's it going? Doing well. Nate, what you, what you doing there? Uh, I am trying to spray my place. There's nothing but, like, earwigs and spiders and gnats just crawling over here, and it's just giving me the creeps right now. Well, you gotta be extra sanitary these days with with with, with the uh, coronavirus and all. Oh, I don't care about that. I just don't like spiders. <laughs> well, speaking of spiders, uh, today was my pick, my turn for pick a flick to choose a new movie for everyone to watch. So I decided to traumatize my fellow co-hosts with 2018's Possum by Matthew Holnes. I hate you, Joe. Seriously. Yep. <laughs> Same. You guys are so welcome, and you are welcome, uh, viewers and listeners. This is sure to be a very entertaining episode. I can tell already. I'm, I'm excited. But before we get into any of that, we'll be talking about what we've watched on our own recently. By the way, I apologize to everyone if my voice is giving out a little bit this episode. I'm uh, recovering from a cough, and so I might go a little bit hoarse from time to time. Make sure you keep your six feet distance from us, Joe. You know, I'm I'm staying a whole two states away from you guys right now. That's still not <laughs> enough, man. You gotta be six states away from us. Uh, Nate, why don't you go first today? All right. Uh, well, you know what? I uh, recently, my folks, uh, since I'm staying with them, have been kind of going through a Alfred Hitchcock binge right now. Um, they have like a collection of all of his short films, his silent films. Uh, you know, the shows that came on his Alfred Hitchcock Presents. So they've been working their way through that, and I've been kind of like sitting in and watching some of them time to time, you know, when I decide not to be a hermit and decide to crawl out of the room I'm staying in. Uh, So one of the first ones I saw was a silent film that he directed back in the 1920-2020 called The Farmer's Wife, which is about after his wife dies, a melancholic farmer struggles to find a new suitor, only to realize that the right woman has been there with him the whole time. So, uh, Joe, you're a big Alfred Hitchcock fan, right? Uh, are you familiar with that? I say so, yeah. Are you familiar with any of his uh, short classics, The Lodger, or even just uh, this one in particular? Yeah, so I, I actually watched, uh, speaking of The Lodger in particular, I, I, I watched that one not too long ago, within the past few months or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I quite enjoyed that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one is not so much the you know murder thrillers that he's so great for. This is definitely a rom comedy, but it leans very heavily on the drama side of it. Like in the very beginning, it's like the wife dies and he's like brooding around the house, like, oh, what am I gonna do? And they have like a couple of hands, and like, you know, there's like a farm hand who just comes in, Mr. Ash, who's like comic relief. And it's it's very poorly paced when it comes to the comedy in this. Um, I didn't know when to laugh or just to cringe most of the time. But, you know, one thing I kind of thought to myself is this was like back in the days when, you know, this kind of filmmaking was still relatively new for a lot of people in Britain. And this is when Hitchcock was still trying to, you know, perfect and craft his style. So he has a little bit of, you know, elements here and there. But I think this one didn't know how to handle the comedy. Like it could have resided a lot more on just the situations the farmer found himself in. But then they would throw in his uh, farmhand, Mr. Ash, just to like chew up the scenery. And it was... I don't know. It, was, it wasn't one of his best. It's it's interesting to see just because in the first few minutes you think, oh, this is going to be kind of a melodrama. And then, no, it's it's kind of just a poorly paced comedy. <laughs> interesting, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, I'd probably say you could steer clear of this one. And I guess, like, I'll probably mention this really quick. Uh, the second film that we saw kind of like after that, we decided, you know what, let's look at one of his more famous ones. And I remember Joe, a while ago, you had said you actually liked the original, the man who knew too much more than the original, uh, American remake. That's correct. So we ended up watching the original from 1934, I believe it was. Around then, that sounds about right. Okay, but the story in a nutshell is a family's vacation in Switzerland is cut short when a Frenchman they befriend is murdered, but not before he whispers about a possible assassination attempt in London. Things become worse when the parents, both uh, Jill and Bob, have their daughter kidnapped by a group of sinister foreign agents led by Peter Laurie to keep them from revealing what they know. So I 
have seen both versions, the one that had Jimmy Stewart and this one, which stars uh, Leslie Banks and Edna West and the immortal Peter Lorre. And Joe, I'm going to have to say I actually prefer this one as well. Oh, really? That actually surprises me considering your thoughts on The 39 Steps. Well, I mean, I think this one is just, I think what sells me on it is Peter Lorre. There's something about his performance where he's playing the villain, but he's just having a wonderful time. He's just like strolling around, just laughing to himself. He's kind of like almost like not fully there, but he is kind of making a very interesting character. Like you don't know if he's going to snap and kill you or if he's just going to laugh while his henchmen just like shoot you to death. He's kind of what made it for me, honestly. So... Yeah, I, I could be wrong about this, but I believe that uh, he was cast in this movie specifically because of his role in M. In fact, this, I think this was one of his first, um, uh, well, not American, but but English-speaking uh, movies. Yeah, I think it was. I think I read somewhere that Hitchcock was so impressed with how he did that movie that he wanted him to just play this villain. Just like I, And honestly, it works. It's actually, if he wasn't in this movie, I don't think it would have been as good as it was. But there's a oh, lot yeah, of... He, sorry, go ahead. He, He's he's fantastic in this movie. Um, this era of Hitchcock in general, his uh, British thrillers, mm-hmm. this might be my favorite overall era of Hitchcock. He has better movies mm-hmm. later down the road. Uh, Psycho, for instance, is one of it, it might might be his best movie in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as an overall era, I I could throw on pretty much any one of his night his thirties thrillers. Uh, the um, the, the Lady Vanishes, The mm-hmm. 39 Steps, yep. The Man Who Knew Too Much. Any of these movies are just kind of the, no matter how recently I've seen them, I can throw them on and have a good time with them if I just want a, a short little fun movie night. Yeah, and that's actually the thing about those <clears throat> films is that they're, they're short and they're fun and they're not supposed to be taken too serious in scope or the themes. It's like, you know what, it's a, it's a chase thriller and uh, there's some comedy in it, you know, and he's having fun. Even like this, uh, even though it's kind of like the stakes are pretty grave, the parents are trying to get back their daughter and there's a whole assassination attempt. There's a lot of fun in this movie, like when they go to the, um, the Tabernacle of the Sun and they start having a, a chair throwing fight. I'm I'm kind of laughing at myself because they're throwing chairs at each other, and one of the guys is like like hypnotized and he's falling asleep, and a chair literally hits him in the face, and it's like it's one of the it's kind of like those stuff I found kind of entertaining about it. Um, so yeah, uh, I would kind of like be up there with you, Joe. Say like if anyone's interested in just checking out this era of Hitchcock, this is a good one to look at. Um, and the last film I'll talk about is. A French movie I remember seeing quite a while ago uh, called The Triplets of Belleville. Uh, it's a movie directed by Sylvain Clement and with original music by Benoit uh, Charest. Uh, when a young bicyclist is kidnapped during the Tour de France bicycle race by the underground mafia syndicate, his grandmother travels to the city and teams up with a wacky yet talented old lady trio, the Triplets of Belleville, to search for him. So, Joe or Alex, have you guys heard about this movie? I've not, no. Okay. I've heard of it. I uh, haven't seen it, know very little about it. Okay, this was like one of the very, very last few like 2D animated films that were kind of like being pumped out at the time. And this guy, uh, Sylvan Command, he is kind of a, still recognizes a pioneer uh, 2D animator in France. His style kind of is seen in quite a few properties there, but this is the one I think that got him like international attention. Uh, what's nice about this movie is there's no dialogue whatsoever it's completely silent and a lot of it's just from the visuals from the character designs which the character designs are kind of kooky but they kind of remind me a lot of like the old walt disney cartoons from the 30s where people's features were exaggerated and their entire physique or body line is just kind of like molded off of this one kind of a, a motif or a character or an animal and i don't know i i kind of enjoy it just because of how playful it is and the music's really good as well it kind of has like that old um Django Raphael uh guitar jazz swing music that was popular in France during the time and it's just really kind of creative in how they do a lot of the soundtrack like they are like plinking old uh refrigerators and ruffling papers and vacuums and they're making an entire song out of it so that's kind of innovative on that end other than that, I think it's uh, just like a fun little movie, but it gets freaking dark sometimes. 
Like there's moments where they, they shoot somebody on off screen, but it's like, oh wow, okay, this is uh pretty grisly. But I, I don't know. I think like if you're interested in seeing something that's from a different country and is still able to tell a interesting, engaging and kind of a fun little story, it's uh it's one worth uh, checking out. Awesome. I'll have to uh, add it to the list as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Alex? All right. So um, the new season of anime has just started this past week. So I've uh, been getting a little bit more into that. Um, I haven't really watched a whole lot of new stuff. Um, still kind of actually hearing, waiting to hear back on one of my friends and seeing what uh, what series he likes best before I kind of jump into some of them. Um, but one of them that I did start was is called Tower of God. I'm going to get you the synopsis here is that uh, Tower of God centers around a boy called 25th Bam who spent most of his life trapped beneath a, beneath a vast and mysterious tower with only his close friend, friend Rachel to keep him company. When Rachel enters the tower, Bam manages to open the door into it as well and faces challenges at each floor of this tower as he tries to find his closest companion. Um, this one is notable because um, in for anime, a lot of the series are based off of manga. For this one, it's asked, actually based off of uh, a manhwa, which is a essentially Korean uh, manga. Um, the With Korean manga or manhwa, I should say, really, um, they're, they're not as generally highly regarded as manga is. Um, oftentimes, they're kind of the B-movie uh, B equivalent to manga. Um, the anime or the art style is a little rougher. Um, the stories may not be as compelling. And there's exceptions, of course. Um, one I've been reading is called Solo Leveling. It's a really popular one. But the another one that a lot of people talk about is Tower of God. Um, it's supposed to be a really good uh, series to read. And this is a kind of a big set because it's a Crunchyroll, uh, ex I mean, not exclusive, but it's Crunchyroll produced. And so it's kind of a bigger, big thing because it's such a very popular manga series. Um, that's finally getting an anime adaptation. And go ahead. Oh, so, uh, so I, yeah, so Alex, uh, I have a question. So, like, I guess I've been told by several um, people, like my brother, for example, who've said that uh, as, uh, Korean uh, manga as well as anime over there is kind of similar to, like, what we've seen over here in the West when it comes to things like Avatar The Last Airbender or The Dragon Prince. Like, is that kind of pretty spot on? I haven't read a lot of manhwa, to be fair. I mean, I've read just solo leveling. That's mm -hmm. kind of it. I haven't really gotten into it as much as I've been more preoccupied with manga. Okay. Um, judging just based off the art in the animation, mm -hmm. um, I don't entirely agree with that. Okay. Um I mean, I mean, Avatar it, it, is kind of its own thing. It is, yeah. I guess I just heard from uh, them that the, the style of Avatar is kind of like reminiscent to a lot of just Korean manga, well, as well as manga. So I, I didn't. I was just kind of curious about that. So, but it's interesting that you mentioned like I guess Korean manga is like not as well received in the Japanese manga community. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it, yeah, it's just not received generally as well all over. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, it's kind of considered almost the B movie equivalent. Um, and I can kind of see why, I mean, comparing solo leveling is kind of one of the exceptions. Um, everything's, everything's pretty, you know, the art style is really good. Um, maybe not entirely up to the same level as some of the manga, but uh, just in like detail and backgrounds aren't you know, as fully detailed as you might get in manga, but even then the story is pretty decent, you know, it gets the point across and it's visually interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, so now with tower, with the anime, anime, anime adaptation of tower of God, mm -hmm. you can really see the difference in animation because it looks pretty rough. Okay. To be honest, unfortunately. 
I mean, here's um, the thing: there's a there's a bit of rough anime out there as well, but oh, for sure. I mean, but I think it's a little bit more obvious in this style. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's there's rough anime where everything is just kind of, kind of like I was mentioning, it's not very detailed. Like mm-hmm. the backgrounds are kind of really just very plain looking, and there's there's definitely that as well. Um, but for this one to be as hyped as it is as a manga. And to finally receive its anime adaptation, mm-hmm. yeah, the animation is a little rough looking. I've only seen the first episode so far. I think there's maybe just two episodes out so, um, currently. Oh, okay. Just started. Okay. But yeah, it's it's that's something that I'm gonna have to get used to is just the the art style. Mm-hmm. Um, story wise, it seems pretty cool. It seems fine. Um. You know, and it seems like it's something it's going to lend itself really well to like the episodic nature of an anime series. But again, the art style is going to be something I'm going to have to get used to because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a bit rough, mm-hmm. not terrible, but coming off of, you know, watching a lot more, you know, really highly detailed anime, especially mm-hmm. like I finished finally finished watching uh, Small in the Forest Spirit, mm-hmm. which is an absolutely gorgeous Mm-hmm. series to watch uh this is a bit of a hard transition yeah I, I guess i've from where i come from when it comes to anime is like if the story's there if the character's there if the premise is there like all of that is solid um mm-hmm. it, yeah animation might be something that might be a setback but if it lends itself to what story it's telling if it's not so pretty or polished but it still is able to carry you through i can actually bypass that but i don't know what well, like i said you're it's only two episodes so far and it's kind of being produced as they're airing it so we'll see now yeah now now alex is this uh series japanese um the original series is korean yeah. it's being made by crunchyroll which is an american uh animated distribution company okay Okay, gotcha. Because yeah. I was gonna say the the, the um I uh, when I think of uh Korean either either mangas or animes or anything like, anything like that, I think of some of the movies from uh, Yan Sang Ho who did uh, famously did Train to Busan, mm-hmm. but he got his start in animation uh, in South okay. Korea, and he did some they weren't they weren't based on anything they were his own ideas, but mm-hmm. uh, I was thinking the animation style in that was very. Like 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 the stories are more kind of central focus, tragic character stories. Like they're, they're not the sort of stories you would think of to do in animation. There's kind of people living their lives with, you know, living through tragedies, and the animation was very kind of gray, subdued, and and raw. So I, I was I was wondering if there's any connection there, but it sounds like the animation style is not uh, the same sort of thing. It doesn't sound like it. No. Okay. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that, so that that's Tower of God. I'm interested in seeing how it progresses. It's going to be something that I'm going to watch. But there's a couple other series that I'm kind of looking at. There's another adaptation, uh, um, or a manga that finally got an ad- its anime adaptation called Glipner. Um, haven't read the manga, so I can't tell you if it's really good. But I've heard it's good, so I'm kind of interested in checking out the anime adaptation. And then, if I like it, go back and through and and read the um, the source material. But other than that, um, I've been watching a lot of. Uh, actually, I've been watching a lot of CS:GO. They have the pro league the uh, going on in Europe right now. Uh, so, because work is really slow, I have a lot of time to catch up on games that have been airing while I'm asleep. So, I've been watching a lot of a lot of that. Um, Wait, so you've been watching while you sleep? Is what you're saying? N- no, I've been watching. <laughs> at work oh, okay because the because the games are airing in europe so mm. they the games start at around 5 a.m oh so i can i can maybe catch like one game half of one game or so if i stay up late enough mm. but then i'll just i can just catch the reruns uh when I'm at work. Right. I guess like when you mentioned that comment, I'm like, wow, Alex has perfected the ability to watch gaming and streaming live while he's <laughs> resting at the same time. Uh, where can I jump on that? Somebody... I, wish I, could. I, wish I, I wish I could. But no. I mean, that's a skill definitely to get out of the COVID-19 right now. If you can sure. <laughs> study sure. while you sleep. Yeah. Um, but CSGO has been interesting. It's, it's a game I've never played. 
Um, I haven't really played a whole lot of PC games, mostly just because I haven't really had a a really good PC. Mm-hmm. So I've been mostly stuck on console. And while they do have a console version of it, it's not something that's really not something that's very popular on console. It's it's definitely a PC game through and through. Um, so never having played it, it's it's fun to watch and just kind of start picking up on the different strategies. Um, not only in just the you know shooting and whatnot, but there's a whole other side to the game that I didn't really realize, and that's the uh, economy because you get money for getting kills, for winning rounds, doing this or that, and so it's just managing that because you at the start of each round you have to buy your guns if you um, if you didn't save them if you didn't like live through the round, so. That's always interesting to watch, um, you know, how watching a team be able to clutch and take out their opponents on like an eco, um, an eco round, only like pistols or something like that, going against like a AWP, AKs and whatnot. So it's been fun kind of learning about the game by watching, you know, the best teams in the world play. Mm-hmm. So because I'm watching, you know, watching guys like uh, or teams like uh, not as Vincere, Navi, you know, uh, watching Astralis, Mousy Sports, uh, G2, you know, with guys like Simple or Kenny S, um, you know, people who've been playing the game for years and are at, literally at the top of the rankings. So it's been fun kind of getting a sense of the game from that. Um, and then as a side to that, they're, or similar to it really, um, a new game from Riot, the developers behind League of Legends, just mm-hmm. started their uh, closed beta this week. Mm-hmm. It's for a game called Valorant. And this game is pretty good, or pretty big, not only because it's one of the first, It's I think it's the first game that's come out since Riot has published League. They've been just a one-game company for a long time, mm-hmm. as far as I know. Um But it's a big one because it's a mix between Counter-Strike and Overwatch. So it's got the gunplay that Counter-Strike has, the sort of economy system that Counter-Strike has, Uh but with the hero system that Overwatch has. So each each character that you can play has different abilities, um, some a little bit more offensive and some Mm. a little bit more defensive uh, than others. So it's, I, you know, barely getting able to being able to see it right now so um doubt i'm going to be able to get a beta key and even if that it's only on pc currently so i can't even play it even if i get one but just learning about it and watching it from you know a lot of the cs pros are playing it of course and a lot of the top streamers so it's cool to kind of just learn about it as you know alongside everyone else and Mm -hmm. get a sense for the game you know i can't think to myself i guess the few businesses or just industries out there that are doing really well are just like online movie streaming services and just gaming streaming services like this one like you know obviously riot is oh. doing very well throughout this whole thing like that nothing is stopping them from their subscriptions or just like i guess uh these tournaments that they're holding or releasing like the new beta versions but i always thought league of legends was kind of like based around like a hero system as well like it is Overwatch. Yes. okay mm-hmm. so yeah, it is. all right so yeah, that's that's kind of where they're coming at it from. I mean, the comparison to Overwatch is is more pertinent than mm. to League, just because Overwatch is first person itself, so right. it works a little bit more. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, other than that, it's it's been fun to watch that and just kind of get a sense of where the game is going to be going, because mm-hmm. it's definitely a game that's gonna that's a that's really built for esports. I mean, you know, with Overwatch and CS both having mm-hmm. uh you know very popular you know i guess term i don't really know pro leagues i guess you could say yeah with the overwatch league and obviously the pro league with cs mm-hmm. and then of course league is huge so mm-hmm. this is a game that's going to be uh that's going to have a, if if they play their cards right and if they can balance it right it's going to have a very big uh, esports community around it Wow. Yeah. Hopefully from uh, this these next few months, they'll just, you know, just launch and just go skyrocketing through the roof. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
uh, of course with the close with the closed beta going on now mm-hmm. they actually tried to hold a tournament the first day of the, uh, after the closed beta mm-hmm. or but <laughs> their servers just couldn't handle it so they had to cancel the the tournament you know, actually, I don't know if anyone else has been experiencing this, but I guess a lot of people's like internet services have been like crashing recently, because I think like everybody's just like on like line and just using the routers like everywhere, and I don't oh, yeah. think like the uh, services can actually provide that much traffic or handle that much traffic going in at one time. Oh, absolutely, yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's definitely a thing for sure. I mean, one of the manga sites that I read was, yeah, ran into a lot of issues kind of the mm-hmm. first day first few like weeks or so of of the quarantine Mm -hmm. (laughs) so they had to buy up extra servers um but yeah that's that's definitely the case (laughs) unfortunately pretty much all buildings will just have nothing but just like server towers and just backup drives that'd be great (laughs) get us faster internet hell yeah Mm -hmm. i'm down for that so i recently watched uh as usual i've been on a kind of a hong kong movie flick uh binge and I recently watched Sammo Hung's 1986 movie, The Millionaire's Express. Uh, I'm just going to read part of the synopsis on as, as, that, that shows up on IMDb because uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little too long to read the whole thing. But the, whoever wrote this synopsis did a fantastic job. Uh, it, it says a multi-genre flick, Western, martial arts, comedy, adventure, etc. With an all-star cast about a man who returns to his hometown, buys everything in sight, and tries to improve its municipal profits by sabotaging a train so the passengers all have to stop in his town and spend lots of money. <laughs> Throw in various subplots involving some Japanese swordsmen, some bungling bank robbers, one of whom is the head of security, and a gang of no-goods who try to mess up the town. That just sounds pretty wild. That does sound wild. <laughs> the movie is wild, guys. This movie is fantastic. <laughs> who, who, so who directed this? Sam Ohung. Uh, Sam Ohung. He, yeah, 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 he... He he's known as a uh, uh, Hong Kong director, uh, martial arts actor. I think he does all his own choreography. I believe. Um, I knew him previously from this as he had a role in Ip Man Two, where he fought against Donnie Yen. But he's also worked a lot with uh, Jackie Chan. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this movie is like it's 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 like one of those eighties uh, star filled comedies. You know, like uh, it's a mad 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 world stuff like uh-huh. that, where they just cram in as many people as they can. Oh, okay. So they kind of like will have like people who show up on screen, but they'll give it that kind of attention, so you know, like oh, this is a big star over there in Hong Kong. Yeah, except for I mean, oddly enough, Jackie Chan isn't in this movie, but what? I saw a lot of other faces that I've recognized recently. Um, I originally watched it because Cynthia Rothrock is in it, and I've seen her in a few movies like uh, Writing Wrongs and uh, it was it Angel of Fury, I believe was the most recent one that I watched with her in it. <clears throat> uh, she's a, an, an American star that went that, that, that was in a whole bunch of Hong Kong movies at the time. Oh, and uh, Yes, Madam was another movie that she was in that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I heard that she was in this, and I've, I, I love seeing her in, in some of these Hong Kong action films because she's a great martial artist. Mm-hmm. It turns out she's only in really like one scene. Yeah, uh, I was just about to ask. Like, I bet like she she gets like high billing, and she's only like in one part of the movie. Well, well she doesn't even really have high billing. Um, I mean, I mean, she she's starred in some Hong Kong movies, so I wouldn't be surprised there. But this movie has so many actors in it that she's one of the villains' group of nondescript uh, background characters, mm-hmm. and she only has one fight scene in the movie. But I cheered because it's a wonderful fight scene. <laughs> um, they make it count for her when she comes on screen. It's like we're, it's one scene, but it's going to be the best one you remember. They do. Uh, uh, another actor who's in this movie is uh, Yun Biao, <clears throat> who I saw in uh, the Lan Nai Choi movie, Peacock King. He mm-hmm. was also in Writing Wrongs with Cynthia Rothrock. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he's, he's just one of the most charming guys you'll ever see in any movie. Uh, but this movie is wild. A lot of it is set up for kind of the big set piece towards the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sammo Hung pisses on a, a Gatling gun. You have cowboys versus ninjas. I mean, literal old school cowboys versus literal ninjas, like Japanese I, ninjas. I, I'm what? sorry. Did you say pissing on a Gatling gun? <laughs> yes, he pisses on a Gatling gun in this movie. Just to cool it off? Uh, yeah, yeah. He had to cool it off. They didn't have any water, so he just peed on it. <laughs> I mean, whatever works, man, but all right. <laughs> Oh man, and like 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 this this movie has a whole bunch of convoluted plot points that all come together in this spectacular climax. It's an over the top comedy, a lot of slapstick, and it might be a little too goofy for some people's tastes. 
uh and but i just i absolutely love this movie it's it's right now if, if you can find it on amazon prime mm-hmm. uh i think it's under the name shanghai express on there but if you can find this movie it's absolutely worth a watch it's wonderful i was gonna actually ask is this kind of like the comedy level of this on same par as like kung fu hustle it's not that crazy um i mean it, 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 you do have stuff like early on Samo Hung gets into a fight with a guy on a snowy mountain and mm-hmm. they like tumble down the hill and they t- <laughs> it rolls up into like a giant snowball. <laughs> so, so it's got stuff like that or like there's, there's there's like a recurring subplot about a guy on a train who's trying to carry on an, an affair, but he's also on the train with his wife. So he's like running across back and forth across the train to his wife and his mistress. Okay. So uh, or, or, or there's, there's some uh, criminals who uh, rob the local bank and they're trying to escape, and but they're they're uh, chained up together, and so there's some there's some shenanigans there. So that, so there's a lot of slapstick physical comedy, mm-hmm. but I feel like you get a lot of that in some of these Hong Kong uh, comedies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just interesting because you know I'm used to these kind of comedies being a Jackie Chan joint, and right. this isn't. But it's this is like a big ensemble kind of epic Western mm-hmm. comedy action film. I mean, honestly, the synopsis you kind of gave in the beginning there was just, you're right. It's kind of sold me on it. I need to see this movie now as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Um, <clears throat> briefly, also, I re- rewatched Frankenweenie from 2012, uh, Tim Burton's stop motion remake of his mm-hmm. live action short film. Um, yeah, yeah. I showed this one to my kids this time. This is one that I saw in theaters. I remember loving, and I, I still love this movie. This is a this is a great send up to, mm-hmm. or well, not even a send up. It's just more of like a love letter to classic monster movies. Anything mm-hmm. from the Universal monsters to mm-hmm. Godzilla, uh, the black and white cinematography mixed with the stop motion mm-hmm. is still very striking. Tim Burton oh, yeah. uses lighting and shadow in this movie, and just the way he uses shades of gray, it, it's not difficult to. Sh- I mean, it's not it's not easy mm-hmm. to shoot black and white cinematography well today. No, and I think that's the problem with a lot of people who try to take movies that were shot in color and say, "Oh, this will look great in black and white." Mm-hmm. And it may look good in black and white, but the problem with that is that is that if a movie is shot for black and white, you're taking into account, you know, the the, the levels of of darkness, the sh- mm-hmm. shadows, the lighting. Yeah, and that's what. Uh, Tim Burton really takes advantage of here. Yeah. Now, kind of like to comment on this, like, you know, I think Tim Burton's always had like this background in just having stop motion animation work for his style. I don't know if you've heard about like the real short film that he did called Vincent. Um, but, you know, this is like precursor I think to I've seen that actually it was a while back. Yeah. It's like a little poem he wrote with like Vincent Price, like narrating it. It's early, early Tim Burton in the making, but you can see him already dabbling in German expressionism, his overstylized horror elements and just like his use of lighting for that. And I don't know when I saw Frank and Winnie or is this remake of it, it made me think, you know, sometimes I think he he does uh, the stop motion animation element very well, but it only works so well for like certain like stories. Like he did a Nightmare Before Christmas, although he didn't direct it, it's still like his property. It has this trademark on it. But he did a uh, Corpse Bride, and that it's kind of a hit or miss with some people. But I've heard like Frank and Winnie just hits that right level of you know um, sentimental like storytelling while still like just hamming it up with like the over exaggerated horror shots and canted angles and playing like into the horror genre you know classics so yeah no yeah i i I absolutely love this movie um and i think it's one of tim burton's uh, stronger movies Mm -hmm. kind of one of his more underrated films if anything yeah, no, yeah, nobody talks about this these these days. I I watched it because I just saw it on Disney Plus and we we're looking for something to watch one day, and I was like, nobody really remembers Frank and Weenie that much, which kind of surprises me because it's so well done. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. You were just talking to this off uh, podcast before this, but it's kind of funny how he got fired from Disney because of his first you know uh, shot of uh, Frank and Weenie was too scary. They said, and then he made this version when they brought him back. So, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> funny it's a full cycle alex have you have you seen this one? Oh yeah yeah i remember actually seeing it in theaters with uh, i think it was my little sisters um i uh, yeah i thought it was great yeah i would love to see more tim tim burton go back to this 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 kind of movie i just seem to do another stop motion movie would be would be, would be fun mm-hmm. yeah. another one of that would be great yeah 
Uh, and then finally, I'm going to touch on, hopefully briefly, because I could honestly do a whole podcast on this next topic, yeah. so I'm going to try to keep it <laughs> brief. Uh, I recently signed up for the new streaming service, Quibi, mm -hmm. which just launched earlier this, this week. So I, I've been using it for probably about, I think, like four days now or so. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole idea behind Quibi is that I think it's uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, I believe, is mm -hmm. one of the people behind this. Yep. It's... A streaming service designed specifically for stuff to watch on your phone, like like, and, and only on your phone. You can't send it to your TV. You can't mm -hmm. watch it on your computer. You, you watch this on your smartphone. You download the app. Uh, and this fascinates me because I have always thought that in the age of, you know, we, we talked about digital distribution recently. Mm -hmm. And in this age where more and more people are for better or worse watching stuff on their smartphones. Mm -hmm. I know I certainly have am with uh, uh with, with 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 little kids around and with babies. A lot of yeah. times I don't have any other option than to watch stuff on my phone at like three in the morning when I'm mm -hmm. rocking a crying baby to sleep. Oh yeah, yeah. But the, I think from what I've heard also with Quibi, uh, Joe, is that this is short form content. Like this is not like content that lasts for like thirty or an hour. This is like ten minute episodes, right? Yeah, well, well, so so Quibi fascinates me because I, I've always wondered what it would look like if you designed movies, or you shot them from the ground up to make them look like, uh, to make them designed to be watched on smartphones. Like, how would you change the lighting? How would you change the framing of the uh, the actors? Would you do close-ups, medium shots? What kind of depth of field would you, how would you change that knowing it's going to be watched on a smaller screen? This takes that idea to the next level mm -hmm. where the, the, the it's it's designed for you know you know people like to watch short stuff on their phones they like to hold their phones and watch short YouTube videos mm -hmm. so yeah yeah you're right Nate every episode of anything they put on there is less than ten minutes long and so far I've seen stuff that ranges between four minutes to nine minutes close close to ten minutes mm -hmm. um, but they're essentially making feature length movies in little bite sized chunks mm -hmm. so uh, for instance one of the things that they have on there is uh, the uh, an adaptation of the most dangerous games starring liam hensworth and christoph waltz mm -hmm. and this thing i'm about probably like what five episodes in now five mm -hmm. six episodes in and it is like you're watching a movie but they they cut things they cut each episode off as a little cliffhanger in the middle of an action scene, so you you know you know I, I'm jazzed to watch what's what's going to happen next, what's going to happen in the next episode, mm -hmm. and in the end, I, I've heard that when all the episodes are out, they're going to release these as basically like a feature length movie you can watch in one go. You know what? This is kind of interesting because I've had several ideas that at the time I was thinking, man, if you could just break these up into smaller chapters so that they could be consumed on that kind of a basis, what would that be like? And now finally, someone's just deciding to uh, you know. Uh, monopolize on this or monetize on this. Yeah. So everything on Quibi is meant to be on an A movie level, kind of like everything is, as, as they say, Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. standards of mm -hmm. filmmaking. And so they have a range of a few different shows like that. You know, they have kind of a Stephen King esque murder mystery show. They have mm -hmm. this uh, kind of melodramatic uh, survival movie. Mm -hmm. But they also have stuff like you you can watch little short news reports mm -hmm. that they have in the morning and the evening. They have kind of these documentary shows that everything from, from nature to fashion. Uh, they have a, a wide range of material on there, of, of content on there for people who like all sorts of different things. But the, the, the big thing, and this is that's give, this is the thing that people give the, movie, the the platform a lot of crap for, is the fact that they design their shows to be watched either horizontally on your phone or vertically on your phone. And by that, I mean every shot is constructed so that if you hold your phone horizontally, it looks like you're mm -hmm. watching a regular thing. But if you turn your phone vertically, the aspect ratio changes mm -hmm. to fit uh, your screen. And that is fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess like in a way, they're just like shooting their content or even just building how it's being screened or shown in a way that it still can work for both formats. And that's going to be a huge game changer for what I've heard. Like this is going to be something like when they actually have deliverables that they can send out, whether on DVDs or just digital copies to have for sale or distribution, you can watch it on any form. But it's like, this is, yeah, I've heard about that, Joe. So that's kind of got my interest now. Yeah, it's it's, it's the whole concept of vertical cinema taken to as, as far as you can think of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, does it work? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I find that some things work better for this format than others. Some mm. shows use it very creatively. Mm. Um, there's uh, one show with Caitlin Olsen 
in it uh, where there's one shot in particular where you see two people sitting in the frame. So, you know, horizontally, there's one person on one side, one person on the other side. Now, seeing both of their expressions at the same time is important for the scene. Mm -hmm. You turn your phone vertically during that scene, and uh, they what, what, what the show does is it uh, stacks them oh, on top of each other. So, nice. so it's like two different frames, and then it cuts to, you know, that they have to hold hands, and then it cuts to their hands. And it's, it's cut together in a very clever way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, some shows do stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Or, or for instance, at, at one point, they're filming themselves on their phone. Mm -hmm. If you hold horizontally, you have a very nicely framed shot of them holding the phone. You turn your phone vertically, you see what they see through their phone. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. cool. Man. Yeah, you're right, Joe. I feel like the delving into this kind of deserves a podcast for itself. But yeah, I, yeah, I think you've touched up on it enough that I'm kind of interested. So I don't know. I'll, I'll have to see if I can subscribe for the three, free trial and see if uh, it, it keeps me on for a little bit longer yeah we'll see i'll um, um i'll check in next week um obviously there are limitations you know anything mm -hmm. vertically if you have a close-up of people's faces it's just a person's face in the frame mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. kind of constricting at times but uh, we'll see how i feel a, a week in next i'll check in next podcast and tell you guys how i feel then after uh, being on it for a while okay yeah keep us in touch all right and with that let's move on to our main topic mother father What's a foot? Only possum black as soot. Mother, father, where to tread? Far from possum and his head. Here's a bag, now what's inside? Does he seek or does he hide? Can you spy him deep within? Little possum, black as sin. Possum is from 2018, directed by Matthew Holnes. After returning to his childhood home, a disgraced children's puppeteer is forced to confront his wicked stepfather and the secrets that have tortured his entire life. Now, I picked this movie because I am a big fan of Matthew Holness' other big project, which is Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, a British uh, comedic television show. I think it was only like six episodes or so. Yeah, it's like a short series, so not too extensive, but yeah. Yeah, have you guys, have either of you seen Garth Marenghi's Dark Place or know anything about it? I don't know. Um, I know you had mentioned it before prior to this podcast, and you kind of mentioned it's just a, for what like budget it's dealing with and what actors are kind of involved in a project, it executes itself very well. Yeah, so, so Dark Place is an absolutely hysterical show. You can watch all of it on YouTube. I highly recommend mm -hmm. anybody go do that right now. Very, very funny, uh, dark kind of twisted Stephen King-esque sense of humor also. Uh, this movie so is directed by the same director, and I was very excited to check it out because of that. I heard that it wasn't a comedy. It was a horror film. If you look yeah. at the poster, you can tell. Yeah, it it takes a complete 180 in the other direction. So so I was very excited to watch this movie because I love Garth Marenghi's Dark Place so much. And uh, I don't think I was prepared for this movie, even dude, so. Dude, no one was prepared for this. No. So okay, let's 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 get into each of our uh, individual reactions. Alex, uh, you're the only one that I, I have yet to know what you actually thought of this. Yeah, you've been the, the you big, think, you've been the big were, horror fan. So let's hear. What it. were your thoughts uh, about Possum going in before not knowing anything about it, and uh, what did you think of it coming out the other side? I was not excited at all to start this. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't do horror well in like almost any genre. Re I can read like. Reading horror stories, that's cool. I like doing that. Mm -hmm. I hate watching... I don't like watching horror movies. I hate... Mm -hmm. I absolutely hate playing horror games. I cannot mm -hmm. play horror games at all. Uh, yeah. Anything that deals with shadows or darkness, it's <sighs> it's just you avoid it like the plague. And yeah. this... And it's, it's not so much like... I hate the, like the scary atmosphere and stuff like that. I love... That's cool. That's really awesome. I hate jump scares. Yeah. Like, I hate them so much. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I was not excited going into this. Um, it didn't, it wasn't as bad as I, as I really had, as really as I thought it was going to be, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Um, I was expecting to be covering my eyes most of the time. I, I wasn't. Well, thankfully. that's, that's, that's actually surprising because I was expecting like you're kind of like covering your face half with a couple of fingers and just ready to be. Yeah, okay. Well, that shocked me. Interesting. Yeah, so not as bad as I thought, surprisingly, I know. Um, but 
the story I mean the story itself was interesting and in enough the the visuals were really actually the visuals were great to be honest with you um so it kept me interested enough that I wasn't just kind of trying to tune it out I was still paying attention to to dialogue even though I had to kind of turn on the subtitles to catch some of the stuff oh yeah I, I was doing the same thing for a couple of those scenes yeah yeah it just it was just a little too quiet for mm-hmm. the for the dialogue mm-hmm. but overall i mean it's a good movie would i watch it again no but it's cool it's a cool movie it's a cool movie put that on the, on the box <laughs> yeah as alex <laughs> says it's a cool movie Man, uh, this is a loaded cannon, and I'm going to have to be careful how I shoot my shots in this or how shots are fired from me. But uh, um, I don't know if I like this movie at all. A couple of reasons why. Uh, Atmospherically and stylistically, as well as concept, it's interesting. But, Joe, you mentioned this is actually based off of a short story uh, written by Holdness, and in a way, I almost kind of feel like, and maybe we can talk about this later in the podcast, but I almost feel like this movie dragged a little bit too much longer than it should have. And I don't know, there's something about horror when it's done well and it paces itself right that it does have an effect on you. This movie has an effect on me, but it's a very disturbing and unsettling because the, the actual like mm-hmm. thing in it is kind of shocking. But once you get past the fact that it's a puppet, and everything else might be going on in his head, that's not what freaks me out the most. It's kind of what the heck is going on behind the scenes, what's going on in this guy's head that I don't want to know, but I know we're going to find out somehow. And I guess throughout the whole movie, that's what kind of kept me in a very unsettled mood is like, how deep are we going to go with this like psychologically? So yeah, overall, I don't know. I, I think the jury's still out right now on how I feel about this. But overall, I kind of would say it wasn't my uh, walk in the woods. So I, I agree about the unsettling bit. I think everything about this movie is designed from the ground up to be unsettling, from mm-hmm. the way it's shot, from the soundtrack, to mm-hmm. the themes, to some of the uh, more overt horror elements. A lot of the movie does eventually come down to subtext and the quote unquote, what is it all about? Mm -hmm. I, the one thing that kept running through my head with this movie was David Lynch. This was a very, at least to me, it was a very Lynchian movie. Yeah. And even more so it's like, I guess, yeah, with, even with David Lynch, there's this surreal nature to it where you don't know if what you're watching is kind of fictitious to the sense that this could all just be a dream with this. I, I don't know. You're right. It does deal with a lot of surreal imagery and just set pieces like other than just like uh sean harris and the guy who plays his uncle uh alan armstrong is there's not a whole lot of other characters he's interacting with which could almost pass off that this could be just like a nightmare you're watching so yeah it's so nothing about this movie is is straightforward a lot of it you get the feeling is abstract a lot of it is about how it connects to the actual theme which we'll get into in the spoil spoilers i guess in the, the uh, in a little bit uh but i i was okay with all of that stuff i i, I, thought, I thought the movie thematically was interesting i th- i like the style i, I like the look of the movie i liked how it always kind of kept you on edge mm-hmm. that being said i was very mixed on this movie because I didn't think there was enough material here yeah. to fill out a feature length movie, even mm-hmm. though the movie is only an hour and 25 minutes long. It does feel like it drags a lot. Yeah. The, the thing is that most of the movie, like 90% of the movie is Sean Harris standing in abandoned locations and walking around with this bag. Mm-hmm. And so every once in a while he talks to this other guy mm-hmm. and that was interesting at first, but then when you do the same thing over and over and over again, it kind of felt like, well, we're not really going anywhere with yeah. this. And every once in a while, another subplot would come in about mm-hmm. this uh, kid on a train that he sees at the beginning and the kid mm-hmm. disappears and everyone mm-hmm. thinks it's him. And that, 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 that comes in every once in a while, but really most of the movie is just kind of atmosphere. And I wanted it to get to the meat of the story. Yeah. The uh, I did think that that the horror elements were used really well. Mm-hmm. I simultaneously was wanting to see more of the creature in the bag, mm-hmm. and 
at the same time, I commend the movie for holding back mm. because because the yeah. few because you do eventually see it move on its own, but when you do, it's only in little glimpses here and there. And even though I wanted to see the thing like running around on its spider legs, I I, I have a feeling if they actually gave us that, it would it would uh, break some of the uh, the illusion and the effect mm -hmm. wouldn't be as strong. I, I was I was honestly surprised of how much of that thing they showed so mm -hmm. early on in the oh, movie. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to see it till like fully revealed until the end. It was like by the halfway mark, we knew exactly what it looked like. Right. Yeah. And you can <laughs> see all the details of it. And I was like, okay. So in in the end, I think I wanted to like this movie more than I actually did. On on Letterbox, I gave it three out of five stars. Oh wow. Be because I I really like a lot of this movie. And I like the tone of the movie, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. I think the movie itself is just paced very poorly, and that hurts it a whole hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. And even though the themes are interesting, I don't think there's enough in the themes to really fill out the whole movie. Story-wise and theme-wise, I feel like it was very one-track. There's not a whole lot of subtext to there. Uh, afterwards, I did go, go back and read the short story, which is 19 pages, which flows a lot better uh it just kind of it cuts to the meat of the stuff you see in the movie uh it does differ from the movie which i'll talk about later i'm sure mm -hmm. but it's it's pretty much the movie minus the scenes of him just kind of standing around doing nothing which yeah. is like the bulk of the movie yeah and i so, actually so yeah go ahead but i will i will definitely be there to see whatever matthew holnays makes next um mm -hmm. i i love him as a filmmaker still i, I like his style here I want to see him do something where he's not kind of chained down to a short story subject stretched out over feature length. Cause I, I, I love him in comedy. I love his atmosphere and horror and I would love to see what he would do next. While I, while I can agree that the movie did drag on a bit, mm -hmm. um, it never felt too bad for me. Hmm. Um, I think one of the things that kind of helped at least those long shots of him just walking around pretty much nowhere was everything looked really great like yeah. it was shot really well mm -hmm. and shot in a way that it wasn't just like oh here's a really cool pretty looking atmosphere or a landscape it was shot in a way that everything was unsettling yeah and for me i guess i i kind of agree with you i guess the only thing that made me unsettled about it is the absence of other people in this oh, town thing. Yeah. I guess that was the one thing I kind of understand, like with this movie, he was shooting probably on a shoestring budget and it definitely shows, but he mm -hmm. uses his settings very well. But I think that's what added to it being such an unnerving experience is that there's nobody around other than these two guys, uh, maybe one or two people they interact with. And then the boy in the beginning with his friends. And yeah. you're thinking, what the heck a town is this? And you're kind of, I don't know from a lot just like the subtext that's going on i just i was kind of like maybe that's why i had a very uncomfortable experience through all this but i almost kind of feel like that does hurt itself in a way because i'm waiting for there to be some kind of a payoff to why everything is being shot like this this kind of isolation this kind of just unnerving settling you know places that we're constantly being finding ourselves in or even why he's going to them all the time there's no explanation for that it's just he he's going there i mean i can kind of disagree but that may be getting into more of the spoiler territory mm -hmm. yeah i mean there is something i kind of thought at the back of my mind why he kept coming to these places or even just these very obscure places and that kind of plays into what i kind of thought the overall message of the movie was going to be but at the end it kind of pulled it under the rug off for me and i'm like oh okay um well that's not what i was expecting so it almost kind of feels like there's there was kind of like a promise for these set pieces and how they were going to play into the bigger reveal at the end. And they weren't really there. And I think that's kind of what disappointed me a little bit. What do you guys think of the actual uh, effects themselves? Because when you see the, the, the puppet early on, I was initially a little disappointed uh, in creepy design. Uh, uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. the, the puppet itself looked just kind of like something that was just kind of thrown together and i was like oh i don't know i don't know how well this is gonna hold up when we actually see it moving around yeah and you do eventually see it mo moving around in kind of like bits and pieces here and there uh later on uh what do you guys think, think, think of just the effects themselves so i had to take a look at it and i think joe maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think a lot of like the effects you see in this are all practical like 
there is no CGI anywhere in this. It didn't seem like there was. I, I have no idea. I will say there was one shot where you see the spider legs peeking out from around the corner in the okay, broad yeah. daylight. That I looked do... a little CG to me, but I, yeah. I, I, I don't know whether it was or not. Yeah, I, I think you might be right. Those might have been just CGI rendered, uh, but it felt like everything else was kind of like just practical puppetry work. And maybe that just is the reason why it was designed the way it was. Like, it does feel like it's just thrown together. But that also plays into the story with Sean Harris's character, Philip, who is this failed puppeteer who tried to make a living off of it. And this puppet is almost kind of like the manifestation of his life's work and failure. So it works, but I understand it's kind of a little bit uncanny as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that I think that's really what they were going for, too. Mm-hmm. Just to kind of even throw, just to throw everyone off even a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but the effects, I think, were, were were fine. I mean, for what it was, for what they were trying to do, for you know, probably considering their budget, mm-hmm. you know, I it worked. Just it worked well for what they were going for. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was. It did look a little kind of shoddily put together, but considering the character and considering everything around him, I think that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Even still, you know, maybe a little bit more attention to detail, but not, not so much that um, it kind of, you know, it took me out of the movie at least. Can I actually say something? So I I did some research on to Sean Harris when he was on set for this movie. And apparently he's one of those method actors who will stay in character all the time on set. And so I've also read he was, in character the whole time while being oh, on geez. stage. I'm wow. just trying to imagine Sean Harris, like even like when they call cut him, just like walking over to the corner of his trailer or just wherever uh, crafts and services are and just hugging the puppet in a curled fetal <laughs> position <laughs> and just holding this, like trying to tell the crew, like it's okay. He's, he's just acting. You're acting right, Sean. He's got, he's got such a weird way of walking in this movie too. Uh, oh like, yeah. He runs. His like hands is directly right in front of him, just like his shoulders and... are like yeah, like caved over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this this movie absolutely is an actor's movie, and Sean Harris acts the hell out of this movie. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know what he's acting necessarily half the time, but his his face like, like like you can tell he's putting a lot of heart and energy into this role. Yeah, I, I think I read I some more. Perfect for it, honestly. He, yeah, no, he he does fit very well, and. I understand like him and Holden kind of like met in advance to talk about this because he was like sold on the script when he read it. And he and him just basically were just talking offset like, all right, let's get this character all nailed out, his backstory, like why he would do this. And so he came prepared for it. But I think it's just a lot of that's not spoken or revealed in the story, like in the actual script. You don't get a whole lot of what happened to this character. But sometimes, yeah. like, Sean Harris knows in a way, and I guess that's what makes his performance a little bit more too believable. By the way, that picture book that uh, Sean Harris's character makes mm-hmm. in the movie, mm-hmm. I, I want a copy of that. Like, like I want to be able to look through those pictures. <laughs> It'll just be like I, a little memorabilia that, or like a little memento that you keep on your shelf and it's like, hey, you want to read a good little picture book? I definitely do not want that in my house. No, thank you. I'm going to oh make you a copy of that uh, no. from scratch, Alex. I will burn it. <laughs> it's not going to make it go away, but it hopefully will help my sanity. So I have a question about this puppet before we keep going on. Uh, in Several times in this film, Sean Harris has been seen disposing this character or this puppet. How the hell is it keep showing up again? Like uh, it's, 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 it's like it's like an Annabelle. It keeps coming back. You can't get rid of it. Yeah, but Annabelle's possessed. Is is this thing possessed as well? Because I got just the impression that it's just a puppet and this is his imagination. So, at what point is this thing just like a life of its own? And what time is it that he's just kind of like messing with himself and not disposing it properly? I don't well, know. I- I, I don't think it's a matter of, of – you're thinking of it too logically. It's not a matter of getting rid of it properly. It's a matter yeah. of thematically what does this thing represent, and it represents mm-hmm. the trauma of something that happened to him in the past. Yeah. It's been kind of clinging to him, and he can't get rid of it. No matter how much he tries to get rid of it, mm-hmm. it keeps coming back to him. Uh, right. So, I mean, that, that didn't bother me. In fact, I kind of expected that. Yeah, uh, I guess so. I guess what I think – and this does play like into what my expectations were in this film, and I don't know. I almost thought that – the reason why this thing kept showing up was because of something else. And it, like I said, 
it's just it kind of unnerved me after a while because there is maybe I was taking this a little too much on the logical sense because it feels too believable I think like in some David Lynch films and other surrealist films there's a sense of like the performances are just too out there they're too outrageous or just the imagery is just too bizarre for it to be taking any sense of this is exists in a logical world this is a little too grounded and maybe that's why I was expecting there'd be some explanation of why it kept showing up again well, let's let's go ahead and talk about that, and let's let's let's, let's move into spoilers now. Mm-hmm. That's okay with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Police are widening their search for missing teenager Michael Browning, who disappeared on his way home from school. At four, I recall your school one, that. There, there, lad. I had no idea. So, spoilers from here on out for possum. Okay, first off, the thing that thing is not a possum. Uh, I don't know no. where he got that. <laughs> no, what the, name, what the name came from? I mean, it sticks with you. The name, I think, uh, if they called it Harry or uh, Langy or something like that, maybe it wouldn't have stuck so well. But yeah, I, I don't know. Possum, just like it, it definitely is not a possum. Well, Interesting. It works for what it is, I guess. <laughs> It, it, it does. I mean, that the name works oddly enough. Uh, interestingly enough, in the short story, it's it's not a spider, uh, yeah. which is kind of one of the selling points of the thing in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the in the book, it's a uh, made to look made to look like I believe a dog's body with a man's face. Oh gosh! Like from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought of too when I read that. <laughs> and uh, in in the so in the movie, this this puppet is a. Uh, it's made to look like a human head, a terrifying, bald, gaping human head attached to a spider's body, uh, which like, if, a, like a giant spider's body. Which actually, if you kind of look yeah. at it, it does look a little bit like kind of like Nosferatu mixed with like Sean Harris's face. And that was intentional. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in the in the book, it was a uh, a human face attached to a, a dog body. But in the, in the book, he talks about how he like attaches like animal body parts to it, like a like yeah. like a dog, an actual dog's tongue, like in it, and all this kind of really gross, nasty stuff. Oh god! And he um he really abuses the hell out of the puppet in the book. I mean, he does kind of to a degree in the in the movie, mm-hmm. you know, where he tries to get rid of it, he tries to drown it, and then he tries yeah. to burn it, but it keeps coming back. And in the in the book, he just there's a scene where he's just like curb stomping the hell out of it. He rips all the the the, uh, the limbs off of it. It just this thing is completely destroyed. Like he angrily destroys this thing, and then he burns it until it comes back at the very end, of course, mm-hmm. uh, which he does in the movie too. But it's interesting because so this thing is is uh, it, it, there, there's a lot of room for interpretation in this right. movie mm-hmm. as far as what actually happened and what everything represents things things mean other things thematically mm-hmm. uh what i took this movie to to be about was that this this possum represents the trauma that he felt from being molested as a child by his uncle who is mm-hmm. the character that we see throughout the movie and I yeah. think he didn't know, like, 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 I think he quote unquote knew it was his uncle, but he didn't know it was his uncle. And at the end, he's just kind of like, yeah, I knew it was you kind of a thing. There's a right. confrontation of sorts. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of disturbing because it's like the uncle is kind of like, play, he, he plays it very just, just snarkily and viciously and just like antagonizing throughout it. But there's a scene where he tries to like, console him and it's it, it brings a whole level of just unsettling like nature to this but that's not the worst part about the puppet in the book joe there's another part that you mentioned that goes into it oh yeah oh yeah so that so in in the in, in the story also uh in the hole where you put your hand for the puppet it's got razor blades in there so that when it to, to operate it you have to like hurt yourself and it's, it's like a really kind of a weird fucked up thing and Knowing what I know from the movie, I'm, 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 I was trying to figure out like, well, well why is, is there all this in the book? In the, in the book, he he uses it, this puppet, primarily to try to frighten other people. He tries to hide it places where he thinks that people will walk by and be terrified of it. Like he hides it under a bridge, looking up through some cracks at one point. Yeah, no, and... he kind of does that in the movie as well. Like he just like sets the puppet out in public places, like parks and yeah. schoolyards, and it's like, why? What the heck? And and I I, I I I was trying to piece together and I I don't quite understand exactly what uh, Matthew Holness was going for, 
I do think it's, I mean, for me at least, it's pretty clear that this thing represents the trauma that he had. But mm. I think the reason he's carrying it around is to remind him just how horrific everything is, everything everything he's gone through. This is his, is, is this him uh, blaming himself for what happened? Is this is a form of torture that he does for himself because mm-hmm. of his own tortured psyche? I don't know. Uh, that would make sense in the book because, you know, you have to hurt yourself to use the thing. And he mm-hmm. clearly hates this thing, but it's designed to be hated. Like, like, like he built this thing to be the most abhorrent thing he could imagine. Right. And he, he, the, he, he does that purposefully, but yet he carries it around with him all the time. And, and I, I, I can only guess that it's because he carries around the memory of what happened to him as a child mm-hmm. around the yeah. whole time. So he, the, he attaches that feeling to this thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, thematically, it, you know, the trauma is something that he just can't really get rid of mm-hmm. in his head. So he's forced to kind of carry around the the puppet, whether you know he really wants to or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 kind of a fascinating movie. Uh, on the other hand, it is very one note. If that's all there is to it, is yeah. oh, this represents childhood trauma. You can get that across in a short story. Mm-hmm. And again, that, I don't think that fills out a full movie. I think you need more there. And the the, the more that they add to the movie that wasn't in the short story is stuff like this subplot with this. I don't know this high school kid who yeah. disappeared, and yeah. uh, it turns out the uncle had kidnapped him, uh, and was hiding him in like a in like a chest. Or they they added the whole uh, confrontation between him and the uncle it was a lot more violent in the movie uh, than the, in, the, in the story. In, in the story, they just kind of I, I don't remember if they even really address it. I think he finds out it was his uncle, but there's no actual confrontation. Whereas in the movie, there's this confrontation where it's hmm. a horrifying scene where he. Like, yeah, it's it, such a gross sound. Yeah, and it, honestly, that I think that point of the part of the movie is actually what I what kind of lost me. At that point, I was kind of a little out. I was like, I was done. I was like, this is kind of not very necessary. I don't know why it escalated this quickly, but this almost feels unwarranted. I understand, like probably they he wanted to put it in just to bring some clarity, and I think. So here's, like I was saying earlier, why I felt very unsettled throughout the whole story. Because there is this, you're right, Joe, there is this supply with a kid who goes missing and everyone assumes it's him. And even me, as I'm watching it, I'm assuming it's him for a couple of reasons. The way this movie is edited, how it keeps revisiting certain locations where he's trying to dispose the puppet and the bag. There was this wild thought through my head that I actually thought he did abduct that kid he hacked him up with his uncle's tools and he was disposing the parts of the body all throughout the, his town and him revisiting that is kind of like something where he was freaking out or it's just something he's doing just to cope with this trauma or that he's going through. But then at the end when it's revealed, Oh no, he's the kids in the chest. His uncle did it. It kind of deflated, but I also wonder if maybe that's what Matthew Holness was trying to play on the audience's expectations as well. To make you think, did Sean, you, you're thinking, is Sean Harris responsible for the kid's abduction? And then at the very end, you're kind of left with realizing he had nothing to do with that, and we were projecting that on him. So I almost wondered if that's kind of also something Matthew Holness was trying to get across, but I, I doubt if that was the case. You know, it's interesting that you say that because it sounds like you and I watched this from very different perspectives yeah. uh, th- th- throughout the movie because... I never got the impression that it was actually him. Now, at 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 one point, it did come into my head of, of like, I wonder if the twist is going to be that it was that he did it all along, and we're not right. supposed to think he did. Mm-hmm. But I th- I thought that the, it was the movie's intention to deflect it from him. I, mm-hmm. I and and part of that may be because when we watch movies, at least at least for me, I, I you you tend to try to relate with the main character Mm -hmm. and you try to find a protagonist. And in this movie, when I saw the character, I saw a victim. I saw, okay, this, this guy is clearly a a victim. He's a weirdo certainly, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, for instance, early on you see him on a train and there's these kids in the train and he's kind of sitting very strangely. Like he does everything strangely. He's sitting on on another part of the train. He's just kind of watching these kids talk and the kids get unsettled and walk away. Mm -hmm. I didn't take that to mean that he was actually a creep. I took that to mean that he was just weird. He was childlike. He didn't know how to behave in Mm -hmm. uh, according to social norms. Yeah. I think part of that is also because everything about this character is very childlike still his his haircut is is kind of like almost bowl cut kind of a thing he walks around with a puppet the whole time 
he doesn't understand social cues. Yeah, well, even just like when he's in his own house and he's like talking to his uncle as if he needs permission to talk or to know where to go. I'm like, he's not left that state. And I guess for me, that's why I was trying to guess, like, could he be a abductor or a, a child like a molester or something like that? Because he kind of does fit the characteristics of it. So maybe, and also this is another reason why I was kind of going on that kind of a tangent with the story, is in reading and doing some research into Matthew Holness and how he wanted to shoot this movie, he actually said he was inspired by a lot of after-school programming. Schools that were trying to let kids know, don't like wander around your neighborhood when you're out of school. Make sure you go home because there's predators out there. And he was kind of trying to make a film that kind of almost paid tribute or light to that because he remembered like growing up those films freaked the hell out of him like they were just done in a very disturbing way because it's like they probably did more harm to him in trying to warn him about adults who might abduct you than it was trying to protect them so it's almost like he was trying to make a film or a style reminiscent to that so that's probably where the whole thought came from like is he trying to give us a forewarning about predators and what signs to be aware of so yeah and i'm and I'm sure he was he was uh, preying on that fear, certainly, uh, mm-hmm. especially with how everyone else is reacting to, to Sean Harris's character. Right. Uh, I just I think it's interesting that 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 you your takeaway was that he could possibly have done it, whereas my takeaway was, oh, this guy is uh, everyone's going to think he did it, but um, there's no way that he actually did because I didn't think that he even had like even kind of the the. Uh, uh, the the cleverness to pull something like that off you know the, the 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 strategizing to do something like that i kind of saw him as a very innocent damaged character right but i guess like that's another reason why the editing of this is something that was a little off-putting because it's cutting around a lot of continuity or just a lot of just the the storyline or just the timeline of things it's like it's not showing him doing everything or how he gets from one place to the next or what happens afterwards or where he goes from that. So maybe that's another reason why I thought that is that this was a very broken up narrative or timeline and that you're not sure exactly what time of day or like when this is taking place or how long this takes place after the abduction. And maybe that's another reason why that just played into my uh, suspicions about this. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of felt the same as you, Nate, that like, mm-hmm. I think he might have he he might have been the one mm-hmm. to abduct abduct the kid, because when he gets home too, he, um, he's talking to his uncle and his uncle mentions something about a a bit of a scandal, mm-hmm. and that's why he's that's why he's come back. So I was thinking they ne- they never really tell as far as I can remember they never really tell you exactly what happened. Yeah. So I was thinking oh there's something going on with this character at he, this you know. At the same time, I think that might be the genius of this movie. Because, Joe, I was looking at Rotten Tomatoes. There's a lot of people who actually rate this movie pretty high. There's like a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes for this. And I almost wonder if maybe that's something that they comment on about this movie, that there's not a whole lot that's explained, either visually or in dialogue. And you spend a lot of time just filling in the blanks yourself with your own wild imagination, with your own projections your own fears or your own opinions about things and sometimes i wonder if that's what kind of adds to the the horror element of this it's not so much as all the stuff that's being seen on screen it's like what you're trying to guess half of the time yeah there's certainly a uh it's interesting because there's not a whole lot going on in this movie but i feel like there's a lot going on in this movie uh worth discussing oh yeah at the same time yeah um, I, th- I think, and, and, and th- th- there are several different angles that you could tackle this movie from. Mm-hmm. I think in the end, it, whatever it is trying to say, I think is very straightforward. But there's a there is the movie is all about subtext and themes mm-hmm. in the end. Yeah, it and is. as and as one of the characters in uh, <laughs> Garth Marenghi's Dark Place says, I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, and honestly, I think, uh, like I said, I, I think Holness is doing something great here. And I think it's, I see what he's trying to do, but maybe, like I said, the constraints he's dealing with in shooting this movie with not having having to stretch a sh- short story, which could have probably worked as a short film and been just as impactful, is kind of what hurts this movie in the, the long run. I think visually, uh, uh, tone, atmosphere, it pulls itself off very well, but I, I almost think maybe 
he should have had a, a stronger story or had more stuff happening and for this to warrant a feature film. Yeah, this this would have made a hell of a 30 minute short uh, mm-hmm. feature length, even as short as it is. I don't think there's enough there to hold it up. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, so Alex, uh, what were your final thoughts on this movie and would you recommend it? I I love the atmosphere. Um, I felt it didn't drag on as much as, as I think you guys did. Mm-hmm. Um, in between the shots of the landscape and everything else, I felt I felt like it was just continually building tension up until the end. Um, the music's good. Uh, they took a little bit of a different route. It's not the general like kind of orchestral skittering violins that you might find them, you know, kind of traditional horror movies. Uh, um, the acting is acting's phenomenal, honestly, with the with Philip being absolutely caring the whole entire movie, honestly. Um, that being said, it's very abstract and kind of hard to follow honestly a lot of the times um i i would recommend it if you're into very unsettling and disturbing kind of creepy horror movies um something that or something that really builds off of a lot of atmosphere because it's not a whole lot of jump scares thank god for that honestly um the concept is is cool. The everything presented is cool. Um, I can see how how you're saying that it would work better as a as a short film, and yeah, I, I like I, said, I I I can get that aspect, but I thought it was pretty good. Is it something that I'm going to watch again? Like I mentioned, I don't think so. I don't like horror movies, <laughs> um, but if it's your thing, then I I would say that this is one worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah, Nate. Uh, yeah. So I still don't know how I feel about this movie overall. Um, there's a lot that is admired about it with Matthew Holness and what he's doing right now with the horror genre, especially with probably with what budget he had, what story he was coming off of, and what kind of angle he was trying to take the whole horror genre. I think maybe it's just it feels like if he was trying to go much more in the surrealist direction, he should have just completely owned that and not keep it grounded in reality. Like he should have kind of gone a little bit more in a David Lynch direction with like Twin Peaks or even just Mulholland Drive where nothing is fully explained. And that's kind of what just makes it such a great watch. With this, I kind of felt like it tried to anchor itself back into the facts and the reality of things. And I think that's might be what hurt it. And also the fact that there's not a whole lot revealed of what happened to this character or what is actually going on. And it just leaves your imagination running wild with thoughts at the very end. It, I think it's very evident what happened actually and what the theme it's trying to address. But I think that's what kind of just held me back most of the time or just gave me this very unsettling feeling is what's he trying to say about this main character. And it wasn't until like the very end when it's like that last shot where I was still kind of left hanging of like, did you want me to find him relatable? Did you want me to still think of him as stranger danger? So I'm still kind of out right now, as far as like my opinion of this movie overall, it's kind of impressive with what he was doing. Um, I just think maybe a different story would have worked better. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, I think I like the fact that it was more grounded, honestly. I, I recently uh, watched Mulholland Drive for the first time. Mm-hmm. Love the first half, had mixed opinions of the, the second half of the movie, where it did go more out there, more surreal. Mm-hmm. And I like that this movie kept the off-putting surreal aspect while still anchoring itself in something a little bit more tangible. Uh, that being said, I, I I don't know what I thought of the final product. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, thematically, I'm I, I kind of had mixed feelings about it. I think I think it has some interesting things to say. I think it says them in a very well way. I do think the movie is uh, needs more story to uh, pad it out, uh, or, or or if not more story, I think he needs something else to kind of anchor the movie in uh visually it's it's fantastically well made but i felt like a lot of it was kind of repeating very similar visuals he's going in through a door he's going upstairs downstairs he's walking mm-hmm. through a field he's walking through some ruins right 
um I, I i like stuff like when he puts the bag down in the woods with that that creepy tree with oh yeah the branching <laughs> off branches like stuff stuff like that yeah. grabbed me oh, and yeah. i wanted more of stuff like that just different because we kept on coming back to that location or coming back to more ruins mm -hmm. uh it was all shot very well i liked the atmosphere i like the way it's made uh i don't think on my own i'll ever revisit this movie i can't really see uh being driven to thinking like oh well, man i i kind of want to check that out again um kind of like the way i have some andre tarkovsky movies which are long and slow i mm -hmm. uh, i'll revisit those because i'm interested in uh oh what's this movie telling me thematically this one i feel like i kind of got it i don't need to sit through watching on harris walk around uh for an hour and a half to, right. to get again that being said I would tentatively recommend this movie, especially if you like kind of slower, more cerebral movies. If you like David Lynch, I would say eh, check it out. It's kind mm -hmm. of worth a watch. Um, Actually, more than just David Lynch, it, any just German expressionistic silent film. Like, you know, I think a lot of vibes I was getting from this is like The Cabin of Dr. Caligari and even just a lot of other silent films from the day and era, like Nosferatu. I think that is actually some... Sorry, jumping in like this, but I think that was actually a reference they make in it with the puppet's head. It kind of re resembles very much of Nosferatu doing that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I could see that. So if anybody um, likes those kinds of films, this is kind of up their alley too. That being said, if this movie did get some sort of uh, premium Blu-ray release, like if it got you know on, into the Criterion Collection or something like that, I would I would buy it and I might rewatch it because I would want to research more about. The, the behind the scenes if they had a commentary i would watch the commentary on this movie i would watch interviews with matthew holness talking about this movie mm -hmm. so uh take that for what you will all right so that will do for this episode of the film illiterates podcast uh you can find more episodes like this on film uh nate where can people find you well you guys can find me here at film uh doing these podcasts and videos with these uh, two schlubs uh who i love very much um, I'm also on Instagram at uh, Nathan underscore stone underscore films. I'm also on letterbox at, uh, Ivan Claysburg and yeah, keep uh, listening here as you'll hear more of me here. Alex. Uh, like Nate mentioned, um, we've got a lot of older, uh, videos, a lot of old film alerts episodes that are worth checking out. Um, but as for me personally, you can find me on Letterboxd on rate your music and my anime list, all under the name Half Scrim. I am also on Twitter, at Alex D. Pat. And you can find me at uh, on Twitter, at Film Illiterates. Uh, and you can find me on letterbox.com slash film underscore illiterate. And of course, you can watch all our videos here at youtube.com slash film illiterates or at film illiterates.com. Most recently, we had a video uh, a uh, video with Nate and I where we did a review of Sleepwalkers, which was quite fun to yeah. uh, to shoot. So I recommend going to our YouTube channel to check that out. Yes, probably a change of pace after watching this movie. You need something lighthearted <laughs> and funny. Very different movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that all being said, uh, keep watching movies and keep it easy. Mm -hmm.